Okay, the mark of the beast. There you see a picture of a woman with 666 on her head and a barcode. What is the mark of the beast anyway? There's a lot of different views on this topic. Here is the Bible verse, or at least one of the Bible verses in the book of Revelation about the mark of the beast. It's in Revelation chapter 13, verse 16 and 17. This is what the word of God predicts. That someday he will cause all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond or slave, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark. So that is a very sober prediction in the Bible. And I believe in the Bible. I believe in the Word of God. I believe in the book of Revelation. I believe that this is going to happen someday. I don't believe that we need to search 168 million websites to find out the truth about this subject. I don't believe in theology by Google. Although I think Google can be helpful sometimes. But ultimately, God wants us to study this topic from what book? Bible. From the Bible. That's right. You know, there's so many websites and so many opinions, and a lot of these opinions uh, conflict with each other. So how do we know the truth? How do we know the truth? We have to study our Bibles. And, uh, you know, sometimes it's difficult to understand or to discern sometimes what the truth is. There's a thinking man on the screen there. He's trying to, you know, think, well, what is the truth? A lot of ideas that are out there. How do we know what really is right when it comes to this subject? I'm convinced that we're going to know by carefully studying the Word of God. That's how we're going to know. So there you've got the text on the screen, or at least one of the texts. And you see the word mark used twice. Uh, the mark of the beast is actually mentioned eight times in the book of Revelation. There's two of them there, and there are six others. Now, these verses in chapter 13, verses 16 and 17 just talk about the mark, but they don't really give us any clues as to what the mark of the beast actually is, right? And you find that in many different verses in Revelation. It talks about the mark, but it doesn't really help you to understand what the mark is. But there's one section in Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 to 12, that when you really study it carefully, these verses will help us to put the pieces together so we can understand what the mark of the beast is all about. So I invite you to open your Bibles, if you have a Bible, and turn with me to Revelation chapter 14. Maybe you've heard of these or maybe you haven't. But Revelation chapter 14, 6 to 12, describes three angels flying in the midst of heaven, giving messages to the world. And one of those messages, which is the third angel's message, has to do with the mark of the beast. And then when those messages are over, in verse 14, we read a description of the return of Jesus Christ. Verses 14, 15, and 16, John says, I, I looked and I saw a white cloud. And on the cloud was one like the Son of Man coming in the clouds with a sickle to reap the final harvest of the earth. So the point is that the three angels' messages are given to the world, and then Jesus returns. So the three angels' messages represent God's last warning to the world, his final warning. And the third message is the one that specifically warns about the mark of the beast. Now, I, just, I don't have time right now to go into every detail of the first, the second, and the third angel. But I'm going to give you some of the highlights and look at some of the main points. Now, if you look at chapter 14 and look at verse 7, angel 1, the first angel, finishes his message with this. It says, worship him that did what? That made, right, heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of waters. So at the end of the first angel, the first angel talks about the judgment, he talks about the gospel, the good news of Jesus. 
And then he talks about the importance of worshiping the creator. Now, notice that word worship. That's a critical word. Worship the creator. Now, in verse 9, we have the third angel giving his message. Verse 9 says, And the third angel followed them, and he said with a loud voice, If any man, and what's that next word? Worships the beast and his image and receives his mark in the forehead or in the hand, the same shall drink the wine of the wrath of God. So it's a solemn message about how important it is that we avoid the mark of the beast, whatever it is. Now, here's my point. The first angel says, worship the creator. And the third angel says, don't worship the beast. Now, my point is that when you look at both of those texts, it's very clear, very clear from the Bible. And these are clues that help us to understand the subject that uh, eventually hum humanity will be divided into two great classes. And worship is a key issue. One group will worship the creator and the other group will worship the beast and get the mark. Do you see that? That's right in the text, isn't it? It's right there in verse 7 and verse 9. Now, when you keep on reading verses 9 to 11, it describes the, the terrible consequences to those who get the mark of the beast. Verse uh, 10 says, The same shall drink the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture, no mixture of mercy, into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the Lamb is Jesus. And the smoke of their torment will ascend up forever and ever. And they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receives the mark of his name. It's a very solemn message, isn't it? One of the most solemn messages you'll ever find anywhere in the Bible. So verse 9 ends with warning about the mark of the beast. I'm sorry, verse, uh, verse 11 warns about getting the mark. And that's the end of verse 11. But then notice verse 12. The very next verse says, here is the patience of the saints. Do you think the saints get the mark? No. The saints are those, it says, here are they that keep the commandments of God. First, it says the commandments of God. So getting the mark of the beast is in contrast to those who keep the commandments of God. If we worship the, the creator and we keep the commandments of God, that's part of the safety zone to avoiding the mark. Now then, the very end of verse 12 also says that they keep or they have the faith of who? The faith of Jesus, right? So Jesus is mentioned. He's the lamb. Actually, the gospel is mentioned in verse 6 first angel. The lamb is in the heart of the third angel at the end of verse 10. And then the last word of the third angel before the period is who? What's the last word of verse 12 before the period? Jesus. It's Jesus, right? And I like that because it tells me Jesus is the last word. He's got the last word. He's at the conclusion of the third angel's message and uh, Revelation 14, 12. So here you see the commandments of God and a picture here on the screen of, of a cross. And who hung on the cross? It was the Lord Jesus, right? And we have this on this backdrop too. We have the commandments of God. We have a, a picture of Jesus hanging on a cross with a family uh, there. I'm, I'm, just, you know, I'm a family man and I really like this picture. It shows me God's love for me and for my family and for your family, for all of us. Now, just for the record, uh, let me say something very important. Christians, and not only Christians, but anybody in this world, nobody is going to get to heaven because they kept the commandments. We are not saved by the commandments. The New Testament is very clear on this. The New Testament says we're not saved by the law. We're not justified by the law. We are saved by our faith in who? Jesus. In Jesus Christ. That's right. And I believe that a 100%. The only way I'm going to get to heaven is through the grace of God and what Jesus did for me on the cross. But it's also true that Revelation puts the two together. They keep the commandments of God and they have the faith of Jesus, both. 
And when you really read the New Testament very carefully and you read the writings of Paul and you read the uh, teachings of Jesus Christ, it's very clear, very clear that we're saved by grace through our faith in him. It's a gift of God. But when Jesus comes into our hearts and gives us the Holy Spirit and we're born again and we're changed, we should be changed, right? That when we're changed, we're going to live different lives. We should become commandment keepers because we're saved by the grace of God. We should live different lives. We should live moral lives. We should live godly lives. And that's what Revelation is talking about. It's talking about people whose lives are changed, who worship the creator, they believe in Jesus, and they keep the commandments of God. And it's those people who worship the creator who believe in Jesus and who keep the commandments, when you look at the three angels, these people are described as the people who don't get the mark of the beast. Right? When you really look at the text, and it's not, I didn't write this, you just really read carefully, that's what we find in the word of God. Now, there's something very obvious Actually, and it's still on the screen, uh, and I've put a little circle around it. Something very, very ob obvious that most people, they just miss it. It goes right over their heads, and they start thinking about the, the mark of the beast. I, I wonder how many of them have picked up this point, which is so obvious, but most people see it. H have, you ever, ha have you discovered that sometimes things are, some things are really, really, really obvious, and people miss those things? And my point is that sometimes something can be right in front of your face, right there, but you don't see it. And there's something that's right in front of your face that many times people just don't see about the mark of the beast. And, and it's the word before the mark. Look at the text. It says uh, people will get his mark. They don't just get the mark of the beast at the end of time with something, you know, on their foreheads, but they get his mark. It's very obvious, but people miss it. And what that means is they get the mark of the beast. It's the, the mark is his mark. See that? Now, in order to know what the mark of the beast is, we need to know who he is, right? Right? And that's why we spent a whole night studying this last night. We spent about an hour looking at the first beast of Revelation 13 because this is the beast that has the mark, which is eventually enforced by the second beast, which we talked about this morning. The second beast enforces, which is in Revelation 13, 11 to 16, he enforces the mark of the first beast. That's what the Bible says. So... We need to know who he is. Doesn't that make sense? We've got to know who this beast is. And so anyway, uh, last night I built my case that the first beast of Revelation 13, 1 to 10, which is what Protestant scholars used to believe for about 400 years. And that includes Martin Luther, who founded the Lutheran Church. John Wesley, who founded the Methodist Church. And John Calvin, the famous Reformed Presbyterian, uh, the famous Baptist pastor Charles Spurgeon, the famous Bible commentary set by Matthew Henry, and all of the translators of the original King James Bible, they all believed that the beast of Revelation, the first beast here, is a symbol of the Roman Catholic Church system. And I mentioned this uh, last night, and, and I think this morning, and I'll say it again, that I don't believe this is talking about individual Catholics. This is talking about a system. Now, this morning, I talked about the second beast and tied this into America. I don't believe that just because a person is, is a member of the Catholic system, you know, that that means he's lost or she is lost. I believe there's going to be a lot of Catholics in heaven, a whole lot. And uh, neither do I believe if somebody happens to be part of the second beast that they're automatically lost, right? Because if that was true, we'd all be in trouble because we are, at least most of us, I'm assuming, are citizens of the United States of America. So there's no sin 
in being an American. And there's no sin in being a member of the Roman church. There are other sins that we've, we've been talking about or we will talk about, and that's the problem, that there are doctrines and teachings that are, that are dangerous, that are really not according to the Bible. Now, uh, I want to show you something very, very interesting. Somebody gave this to me a long time ago. It was a family Bible, an heirloom Bible. And it's a, it's a very old uh, New Testament that belonged to a man named uh, Daddy John. And he was actually a, a minister, John Newton Correll. This was his Bible. He died in 1901. He was a lay Presbyterian preacher. And what, what's, there's a lot of things about this Bible that are very interesting. But one of the things that's very interesting, I interesting is the footnotes. So there it is, right in this Bible. You can look at this when the meeting's over if you would like. Verse 16, which we already read about the mark being enforced. In the forehead and in the hand, nobody can buy or sell unless he gets the mark. And it says here, a mark, uh, sub, which means submission to the rites and the ceremonies of the papal communion. In their right hand, active obedience to the papal power or in their forehead by outward profession of its doctrines and infallible authority. So that's the way the footnotes of this Bible interprets the hand and the forehead. It has to do with submission in the mind and submission in the actions to the authority of the Roman Catholic Church. And this is a Protestant Bible. It's a it was the Bible of a lay Presbyterian preacher. And, and my point is simply this, that this Bible shows that there was a whole lot of people for a long time who understood that the mark of the beast has something to do with the beast, which is the Roman Catholic Church system. Are you following me? That's, uh, that's very, very clear from that Bible and from history. Now, let's just look at the summary of what we've already read about the three angels' messages in Revelation 14, 6. 6 through 12, we, we know for sure from the word of God that those who worship the creator are in contrast to those who worship the beast, right? We know that right from the text. We also know that those who keep the commandments and who follow Jesus will not get the mark of the beast. We know that from verses 9 to 12. Those verses are very, very clear. And another uh, point I want to make, which I haven't made yet, but this is, a, this is about as important as it gets, and this is this. When you study the New Testament carefully, you will learn that the creator of heaven and earth is really Jesus Christ. It says that in John chapter 1, verse 10. It says, uh, he was in the world, and the world was made by him. And the world knew him not. Uh, Colossians 1 verse 16 talks about Jesus as the maker of heaven and earth. Ephesians 3 verse 9 talks about Jesus as the maker of heaven and earth. The Father and the Son cooperated in making this planet. And Jesus was very, very, very involved in making everything that we see today. Everything around us. So when the Bible calls us to worship our creator, it's a special call to worship Jesus, not just as the Savior, but as the maker of all life. That's as biblical as the Bible when you read those verses that I mentioned. And so when we put these pieces together, what's happening is, is the mark of the beast is a challenge to the creator, who is Jesus. And it's a challenge to the law of God. And when the mark of the beast is enforced, people who worship Jesus, who worship the creator, who understand the gospel, who understand the cross, who accept Jesus and follow him through the Holy Spirit, they will not get the mark of the beast. But those who don't are in danger of getting that mark. Now, how do we know what's true and what's fake when it comes to the mark of the beast? I'll tell you. And I've got, I've got them right here. And I bring these with me sometimes when I travel. They're very heavy. These are not the originals. 
but they are solid stone. They're the Ten Commandments. Sometimes I, I get a real kick out of checking these through in a backpack through security. <laughs> and how do we know what's true about the mark of the beast and what's false? What is the mark of the beast? Well, we have to go to the original. Here's the original. It's the two tables of stone written with the finger of God. The finger of God. This law is different than any other law that's ever been written. Because number one, it was written with the finger of God. Number two, it's written on solid stone. And why do you think God did that? He did that to demonstrate that his law is permanent. His law cannot be changed. Now, here's my point. When you look at the Ten Commandments, there's only one commandment. How many did I say? One. Just one. That talks about the one that made heaven and earth, the sea, and everything in it. We looked at Friday night that when you look at all the, all the characteristics of the first beast, there's only one organization in all of history that fits the prophecy, which is the Roman Catholic Church system. And we also looked at the second beast. And we, we did this together. There's only one nation that fits every detail of the prophecy, and that's the United States of America. And when you look at the third angel's message, there's only one commandment that deals with the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in it. And it is commandment number four. And it's the one commandment that starts out with a unique word that's not in any other commandment. Eight of the commandments say, thou shalt not steal or bear false witness or, or lie, or well, that's bear false witness, uh, or, or kill or commit adultery. Thou shalt not bow down to idols. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. But there's one commandment that starts out with the word remember. And it is in Exodus chapter uh, 20, verse 8, that says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work. And then it goes on, and at the end of the commandment, it says, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and everything in it. And he rested on the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and he hallowed it. He made that day a holy day in honor of the fact that he is the maker of all life. If you ask any Jew what day is the Sabbath, if they're a good Jew, they'll tell you it's Saturday. Sundown Friday to sundown, sundown Saturday. If you look up uh, Sabbath in any dictionary, it'll tell you it's the seventh day of the week. It'll say it's Saturday. If you look at same in any encyclopedia. If you look at languages around the world, in the majority of languages, the word for Saturday is Sabbath. Who speaks Spanish here? How do you say Saturday in Spanish? Sabado, which means Sabbath. How do you say, uh, anybody know Russian? Subota. That's right. I've been to Russia three times. It means uh, Sabbath. And in languages all over the world, Saturday is Sabbath. Uh, in the Ghana language, it's interesting. Somebody gave me a little piece of paper on this. That in Ghana, if I can remember it, I don't have my notes. I used to have it. Uh, the, the day for uh, Saturday for Sabbath is, means this is God's day. And the day for uh, Sunday, which is the first day of the week, and I forgot exactly how to pronounce it, quasi umbrani, that's it. And quasi umbrani means, it means, get this, white man brought this day. <laughs> that's what it means in the Ghana language. Yeah, uh, you can do your homework on this. What day did Jesus rise from the dead? He rose on Sunday. And what day does Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John say that day was? It's the first day of the week, the day after the Sabbath. 
So the Sabbath is the seventh day, and Sunday is the first day of the week, and that's the day that Jesus, Jesus rose. And I praise the Lord that he rose from the dead. Amen. Praise God. His resurrection was glorious. But the question is, does his resurrection on Sunday mean that the Sabbath has been changed to that day? If you look at the Bible, you won't find any evidence for that. Now, let me go to my next slide. It is a fact, it's no secret, that the majority of Christians in this world right now uh, do not keep the seventh-day Sabbath, but they go to church on the first day of the week. Isn't that right? The majority do. And I want to say for the record that I believe there's going to be a whole lot of Sunday-keeping Christians who have been keeping Sunday for a long, long time down throughout history who are going to be in the kingdom of God. I believe that, no question about it. But I also believe that as we get closer to the very end of time, Daniel chapter 12, verse 4 says, in the time of the end, knowledge is going to increase. God is going to bring light to our minds about this issue as we get close to the mark of the beast because he wants us to understand what the real issues are. So the question is, well, we know this, that most Christians go to church on Sunday right now. Um, you know, where did this come from? Why, why are they doing that? If you ask the average Christian, they will say it's because Jesus rose on that day. But if you look at history, there's a historical reason behind this. Now, yes, it's true. They, they rationalized the switch in the light of the fact that Jesus rose on Sunday and there was a whole historical development of how the Sabbath went down and Sunday came up. It had a lot to do with compromise with uh, pagan sun worship. And the Roman Empire worshipped the sun on Sunday. And there was compromises, especially also hostility to Jews. As time went on in history, there was a lot of hostility to Jews. And the Jews kept the Sabbath. So the Christians, many of them wanted to get away from the Sabbath because it looked Jewish. And they shifted towards Sunday especially because they were in Rome, and especially when Rome was at war with the Jews, it became very unpopular to be like the Jews or do anything like the Jews. So the, uh, the switch developed gradually, but it's also true that when the Roman Catholic Church grew in power, they took the ball and they ran with it. And this is a, a quotation from a catechism, a Roman Catholic catechism, a Catholic doctrine, published in 1946. It's uh, Peter Geierman's Converts Catechism of Catholic Doctrine. Question, what day is the Sabbath day? Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Question, why then do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer, we observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church substituted Sunday for Saturday. And I've got the quote right there. They, they transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. And that is uh, page 50 of this book. If you want to see this when the meeting's over, you can come up and you can take a look at this. And, and there's many other statements like this that I could, I could multiply where they claim that they change the Sabbath and they basically say it's a sign of our authority that we were able to do that. Now, here is a very shocking uh, statement from a very famous American Catholic cardinal named Cardinal Gibbons, November 11, 1895. And this is what he said. Of course, the Catholic Church claims that the change from Sabbath to Sunday was her act. And the act is a what? It's a mark of her ecclesiastical authority in religious things. So what they're saying is we changed the law of God. And the only uh, reason why we have the power to do that is because we're the true church and God gave us that power. And it's a mark of our authority as the true church. That's what they say. Now the question is, should we, uh, should we believe that? Or should we follow the Bible or the Pope? You know, which, which one? When the church says it's a mark of our authority, we are the true church, are they telling the truth? Or are they not? Uh, I've written a book on this, and if you're interested, we have this book in the back for the book sale. Just came off the press. We printed 20,000 of these. And it's called The Truth About the Sabbath. Proof that the seventh day, <clears throat> Saturday, is still God's holy day. And all of the history is in this book. How it was changed, the time of 
Constantine, sun worship, compromises, Old Testament, New Testament, the life of Jesus, the controversy with the Pharisees, the statements in the New Testament that seem to say that we don't need to keep the Sabbath anymore, like Romans 14, Colossians 2, all of these scriptures are carefully looked at in this book. It looks at it from every single angle. And ultimately, it goes back to the teachings of Jesus Christ himself, who said that he was Lord of the Sabbath. And it goes back to the Ten Commandments. Now, when we go back to Revelation 13, 16, we've already read the beginning that one of these days, the mark of the beast is to be enforced by law. That's what the Bible says, right? It says that nobody will be able to buy or sell unless he has the mark of the beast. He causes all to receive the mark. And if what I'm telling you today is true, that Sunday is a mark of Rome's authority, and Revelation says this mark is going to be enforced by law, then that means that at some point we're going to see Sunday legislation. We're going to see laws in America and around the world enforcing the keeping of the first day of the week. And let me clarify again uh, something right now, and uh, is that nobody has the mark of the beast right now. Nobody. But when it is enforced by law, then there'll be a time of decision where people have a chance to make a final choice. Now, is this even remotely possible? Can Sunday be enforced by law in, in the land of the free and the home of the brave? Can America, the second beast, ever enforce the mark of the first beast? Can, can this happen in, in a land that still has a constitution and a, a, uh, an amendment that says Congress is not to make a law to establish religion or to prohibit the free exercise thereof? Is this possible? Well, let me share some very important information with you that not only is this possible, but we're not far away from that happening. How many of you have heard of something called climate change? Have you heard of climate change? Have you heard of that? Uh, I've got actually written another little book, and I think I've got a picture of that, which we'll have this tonight, called Climate Change is at the End of the World. This, these are both two, two new books from Whitehorse Media. Climate change is being discussed... It was big in the Democratic, uh, you know, if you, watch, if you watch the Democratic candidates, many of them talked about climate change. Almost any time there's a major disaster these days, the news media are tying it in to climate change. And what's happening is that disasters are on the rise. We are in a time of uh, terrible well, not at this moment right now, but when hurricane season hits, the hurricanes are getting more powerful. There are storms, fires, floods, famines, locusts in East Africa moving into China. And almost any time a weather-related disaster hits this world, the media is connecting it to climate change. That's what's happening right now. And here's the idea. The idea is that humanity is overusing fossil fuels like oil and, and, and gas, natural gas. And this overuse of fossil fuels, the production is creating what's called greenhouse gases. And these greenhouse gases are going up into the environment and they are uh, apparently trapping heat down here on the planet. And the more we use fossil fuels, the more the greenhouse gases go up, like uh, carbon dioxide and methane gas. And these are warming the planet and warming the oceans. And this is contributing to these disasters. That's what, uh, what we're being told. And people are being told that unless the governments of this world come together and act now, fast, we only have a few years left before we have huge problems on planet Earth and millions and millions of people uh, die. That's what we're being told in the, in the news media and by a lot of other sources. Now, it's also a fact that one of the leading advocates in this world for global action to stop climate change is guess who? Pope Francis. That's right. And it's also true that one of the major documents that is supporting the climate change uh, argument and movement 
is Laudato Si, which I told you about in the last meeting. The Pope's encyclical on the care of our common home, the care of the environment, came out in 2015. It is also a fact that a big part of Laudato Si and of Pope Francis's recommendations to help solve the problem, the global problem of climate change, is, guess what? It's the enforcement of Sunday. In uh, Laudato Si, page, or section 237, Pope Francis said, Sunday, like the Jewish Sabbath. Now, it's actually, um, the, Jewish, uh, the Sabbath is not the Jewish Sabbath. The commandment says, it's the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord. You'll never find in the Bible that the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Jews. That's a Catholic teaching. It's not a Bible teaching. Sunday, like the Jewish Sabbath, is meant to be a day which heals our relationships with God, with ourselves, with others, and with the world. And Pope Francis is a strong advocate of uh, enforced Sunday observance as part of a global solution to help solve the problem of climate change. Here is an article that came out uh, some time ago in a very well-known publication called The Guardian. And the title is Slow Sunday, the simple solution to global warming. Using Sunday as a day of rest and renewal would be good for our personal health as well as the health of the planet. Not long ago, Sunday used to be a day of rest, a day of spiritual renewal, a day for families to come together. But we have changed Sunday from a day of rest to a day of shopping, flying, and driving. However, in the context of ex excessive carbon dioxide emissions, which again are supposedly warming the planet and contributing to these weather-related disasters, it says, uh, which are bringing catastrophic upheavals, we can and should restore Sunday to a day for Gaia, which is uh, another term for the Earth. So the Guardian is talking about it. Here's, uh, this just came out. Um, they've been actually doing this for a while, but this was an article I read uh, about Rome, that Rome was to ban, is banning cars and scooters on Sunday as Italy's cities fight smog. And they're calling this an, an eco-Sunday. And the idea is, you know, that we need to limit the cars and we need to limit the factory production because this is all sending up more carbon dioxide into the air, which is contributing to global warming. So the idea is that keeping Sunday and restricting Sunday travel will help solve environmental woes. Pro-Sunday arguments are many. And they include help for morality, families, health, and society. And if you've been, I don't know if you've seen any of these, but there's been a whole lot of articles that have recently been coming out of the news media that are talking about the importance of keeping Sunday. Here is uh, the Associated Press, 2014. Keeping stores open on Sunday is not beneficial for society, says Pope Francis. The Parliament, which is a European publication, Sunday work is a danger to our health and our safety. ABC News, German court enforces day of rest. At the bottom there it says, uh, Germany's constitutional court has now upheld a complaint made by the country's Catholic and Protestant churches based on a clause in the German constitution that Sunday should be a day of rest and spiritual elevation. Fox News. Let's make Sunday a day of rest for God's sake. North Dakota. North Dakota Senate rejects blue law repeal because citizens should use that time to go to worship. Uh, there are actually blue laws on a lot of books. They haven't been enforced for, uh, in recent years, but sun, uh, North Dakota is upholding those blue laws. And some people said, we, we need to get rid of them. And North Dakota said, no, we are going to hold on to those Day, on those blue laws because we can't have distractions that might lead people away from church. CNN, this uh, senator, Sylvia Allen, uh, you can Google this. The title there is Senator Church Attendance Should Be Mandatory. And she said we should be debating a bill about closing, uh, closing businesses on Sunday and requiring people to attend a church of their choice on Sunday. And I think, wow, how's that for religious liberty? 
you're required to go to a church of your choice. So you can choose which one you want to go to when the law says you have to go. Here's another uh, publication called First Things, which is a very influential journal of religion and public life. And the article there in the middle is Bring Back the Blue Laws. Bring, and I could show you many, many more, many more articles. Now, uh, let me share something about chatter. Have you heard of intelligence chatter? Uh, it's true that right now, we're not seeing Sunday laws staring us in the face. We're not. But let's talk about chatter. Chatter is where uh, intelligence agencies, it says there in the article, uh, monitor terrorist conversations. And they do this to see what the terrorists are up to. And if, uh, if, if it gets loud enough, then they really listen. And let me show you at the bottom here, it says when spies notice volume spikes on several networks and compare them with the content of recent communication, intercepts, satellite observations, and information passed to spies on the ground, patterns emerge. So the government and their intelligence agencies are monitoring the chatter of terrorist organizations to see whether they're about to plan something big whether they're about to plan something big. And what we are seeing right now, if we are intelligent prophetically, if we're monitoring Bible prophecy, then we should be able to see that there is a whole lot of chatter going on right now. ABC News, CNN, Associated Press, The Guardian, and the list goes on and on and on. There's a lot of chatter out there. Now, it's true that we're not facing Sunday laws right you know, in the face right now. But what would have to happen for the chatter to become a reality very quickly? I'll tell you. I'll tell you what would have to happen. What would happen, what needs to happen, and I, what I believe will happen is a rapid sequence of terrible disasters that can quickly bring this world to its knees. Quickly. Uh, such as the, the fires in Australia. You've heard about the big fires all over Australia that are being blamed on climate change. Earthquakes in Puerto Rico, the Tal vol volcano threatening the Philippines, Locusts in East Africa moving into China, which are being blamed on climate change. The coronavirus. Have you heard of the coronavirus? Who knows how big that's going to get? We don't know. Um, but it is definitely a big problem. And it wouldn't take much in the days ahead for a sequence of big disasters like what I just described. If they hit, boom, 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 rapidly, just like what happened on September 11, when the towers came down unexpectedly on a Tuesday morning, when the sky was blue, all of a sudden people woke up and they realized that it's a new day. Remember that? It's a new day. And things like I just described, things like them, and there'll be different things, there'll be new things you know, in the days ahead. And things like this, I am completely convinced, are going to continue to hit this planet. One by one, and things are going to get, are going to get worse. And as I mentioned, uh, I think it was this morning, there's bad news and there's good news. The bad news is that the, it's going to get worse before it gets better. But the good news is that when it does get gets better, it's going to be fantastic. When Jesus finally comes and gets rid of sin, it's going to be fantastic. And God wants us to be ready for that. And what prophecy basically tells us is going to happen in the future is that we are going to finally come to a time of a global crisis. And how long God is going to hold that crisis back, nobody knows. It could begin tomorrow. We just don't know. 
But when that global crisis hits, according to Bible prophecy, the sure word of prophecy, and according to all the chatter that we can see, and what Pope Francis, the most popular human being on the planet, is pushing for right now, which is Sunday legislation, there will be a global false solution that will rise out of this crisis. And that global false solution based on the Bible and based on the chatter that we see around us is going to be the enforcement of Sunday. And they're going to say it's for the good of the planet. It's for the good of the environment. It's for the good of families. It's for the good of our spiritual lives. It's for the good of our health. All these arguments are going to all come into play during the final crisis. And people are going to think, you know, in a crisis, that sounds good. Because have you heard the expression, there's no atheists in fox foxholes? When people get desperate, they look up. And they're going to be, people are going to be saying, we need to get back to God, which we do. But then they're going to make a big mistake, and they're going to say, we need to enforce Sunday, the first day of the week. And when that time comes, I tell you, the battle is going to be on like we've never known. And we're going to hear the, the, the image of the beast, and, the, and the, the first beast, the second beast, the mark of the beast, and that's when the third angel's message is going to cry out with a loud voice through a group of people who understand this prophecy. People that God has prepared, just like Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego and Joseph and John the Baptist. God's going to have his people who are going to stand up and they're going to give the three angels message with a loud voice and they're not going to be stopped. They will not be shut up. God's power is going to be behind them and nothing can stop them. And in the midst of this final crisis, they are going to be warning the world to, to avoid the beast and the image and the mark. And they're going to be lifting up, as we've already read, the commandments of God, including the fourth commandment, which says, remember. The only one that says, remember, don't forget. And by the way, where do you remember anyway? What part of your body do you remember? You remember in your forehead, in your mind. And it says, don't work on that day. And what part of our bodies do we work with? With our hands. The forehead and the hand is part of the fourth commandment. And as the law of God is lifted up before the whole world and people are led to see the first commandment, the second commandment, the third one, and the fourth one that says, remember, I'll tell you what's going to happen. On radio, on television, through YouTube, the internet, Facebook, all around the world, God's people are going to be giving this message. And the people of this world are going to look at the Ten Commandments for the first time. They're going to look at the original. And you know what's going to happen? The Holy Spirit is going to be convicting people of sin. That they've broken the law of God. Now what, what or where will the Holy Spirit point people to who have been convicted of their sins of breaking the law of God? The Holy Spirit is going to be pointing people to one place for the forgiveness of sins and for salvation from sin by the grace of God. And that one place is the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave his life on a cruel cross for Catholics, Protestants, Sunday keepers, Sabbath keepers, Jews, Muslims, Wiccans, atheists, everybody. And, and, and during that final moment, when the law of God is lifted up, Jesus is going to be lifted up like never before. And the Holy Spirit is going to be appealing to people powerfully to choose Jesus for, for, for the forgiveness of sins and salvation by the grace of God and to take a stand, to take a stand against the beast and against the image and against the mark, to choose to stand for the creator who is Jesus Christ and for his holy day, the day that commemorates him as the maker of heaven and earth. And then we'll be in a time of final decision. People will make a choice. One group will, be, will choose the creator. The other group will choose the beast. One group will choose the truth. Another group will choose tradition. 
One group will choose the seventh day Sabbath, the memorial of Jesus Christ, our maker. And the other group will choose the first day of the week. And it'll happen in the forehead, in the mind, and in the hand. Now, don't miss this point. The mark of the beast in its final analysis is a mark in people's minds and in their hands that they have settled in to commandment breaking. That's what it means. They've settled in to sin. They've settled in to breaking the law of God and to going against their creator who loves them and who gave his life on the cross to save us from sin. That's the deep issue of the mark of the beast. And we all have to decide, are we going to settle into sin? Breaking God's law like the devil, like Lucifer? Or are we going to settle into Jesus and to his power and to his grace and by his grace to stand up for his law and to do what's right? You know, it's wrong to murder, don't you think? It's wrong to lie, don't you think? It's wrong to commit adultery. It's wrong to covet. It's wrong to, uh, to dishonor your father and mother. It's wrong to have idols before God. It's wrong to take his name in vain. It's wrong to do these things. And it's wrong to continue to break the seventh day Sabbath. And the reason why it's bad is because it hurts us. God is a God of love and his law is a good law. It's a perfect law, and it's what's best for all of us to do what's right and to stand for Jesus and to love God and to love our neighbor as ourselves. That's right. In Revelation 14, 12, the conclusion of the third angel's message describes the final people who are willing to stand for truth, to stand for Jesus. It says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And, and you know, I, I know for many of you this may be a brand new subject. Maybe you've never heard this before. And I encourage you to study this out from the Bible and to let the word of God make the final decision for you. And this verse is very, very clear. At the end of the Mark of the Beast warning in Revelation 14, 9 through 11, it describes people who keep the Ten Commandments and who follow Jesus Christ. That is the truth. And God is preparing people right now to be part of these people. It's right there in the word. It's not something I've made up. It's not just a, uh, you know, a teaching from one particular denomination. It's Bible. It's Bible truth. Now, let me tell you, uh, I actually forgot this slide. When this is over, verse 12, verse 14 describes Jesus coming. He's coming in the cloud with a sickle, a sharp sickle to reap the harvest of the earth. He's coming to divide and to gather those who are on his side versus those who aren't. That's what the Bible says. And the point is that we all have a decision to make, don't we? One direction, and on this screen you see here, there's the right way and there's the wrong way. And that choice will eventually be brought before the whole world. And the, the mark of the beast issue is God's way of bringing up to the whole world the issue of which path we're going to walk on. If we go the wrong, if we take the wrong path, it's a dangerous path. It's the path of the mark of the beast. It's the path of sin, and it's, it's fatal. If we take the, the, the correct path, it's the path of trusting Jesus as our Savior, honoring him as our creator, and choosing to keep the Ten Commandments. That is the safe path. The dangerous path is to go the other direction and to get the mark of the beast. And God's going to allow this whole issue to bring it all to the front. Is his law really a good law or is it bad? Is it good for us to keep the Ten Commandments, including the Sabbath, or is it bad? That's the issue. One day it hit me as I was studying this whole issue 
it hit me like a, like a bolt. When you really study the Bible carefully, you'll discover that the finger that wrote the law on stone is the same finger that was on a hand that was nailed to a cross for you and me. And that is the most powerful motivation in this universe for us to love Jesus and to choose to stand for his commandments. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And when you realize your creator is the one who died for you, I tell you, it's a powerful pull on the heart, isn't it? And when you realize your creator knows what's best for you, he loves you, he wants what's best for you, and, you know, it's good for me and my wife that neither one of us commit adultery. Don't you think? It's good for, for our children to grow up in a home where the parents are committed to each other. It's, it, is it good for us to learn to tell the truth? It's good for us. Is it, is it good for us to love God and our neighbor as ourselves? Is it good for us not to have any idols? You go down through all the Ten Commandments and really think about it with your conscience. Honestly, the Ten Commandments are good for you and for me. And that also applies to the seventh day. To rest on the seventh day. And by the way, the Sabbath means rest, not works. To rest in our Creator's love and to honor Him is good. It's good for you. It's good for me. It's good for us all. Dear Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Lamb of God, and also the Maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in it. Jesus did say in Matthew 12, verse 8, that he is Lord of the Sabbath day. That day is your day for us to rest and trust and get centered in our maker. Thank you, Lord, for everything. Thank you for this weekend. Thank you for everybody that's come and those who have been watching on uh, Good News Television. And we just pray, Lord, that you will continue to guide us. We don't know when the final crisis is going to hit. But help us to, to get ready because it can happen very quickly. And all of a sudden, we'll be in that final time. And we pray that you'll get us ready and use us to help others to know Jesus and to know the, the real issues from the Bible. Please bless everybody here. Bless me and all of our families and those that we love. And above all, Lord, we know you love us and you want us to be with you in the kingdom when Jesus comes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.